Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Yağmur Civan Uyanık and I am the Administrative Assistant at Koç University's Research Center for Anatolian Civilizations. Thank you for taking time out and being here today for the second talk of this academic year's Anamet talk series. Title of the talk is Rediscovering Anatolia's Forgotten Literary Heritage. Today's speakers are former Anamet fellow Saranur Yildiz and Andrew Peacock, who will be a senior fellow at Anamet in 2022. And our moderator will be Zeynep Oktay Uslu, who is assistant professor in the Department of Turkish Language and Literature at Boğaziçi University. She is a specialist of the history of Islam, Sufism, and vernacular religi religiosity in Anatolia. Dr. Oktay is the author of an edited text with an extensive introduction on 14th century Dervish literature, Mesnevi Baba Kaygusuz, and she is in the process of revising her dissertation into a monograph titled The Perfect Man in Bektashism and Alevism. A Q&A session will follow the talk. You are more than welcome to write your questions into the chat box throughout the event. Um, lastly, I would like to inform you that the microphones and videos of all attendees are turned off automatically and that this event is being recorded. Have a wonderful talk. Thank you very much, Yamur Hanım, for that introduction. Um, I would like to begin by sharing my screen and to show you uh, the topic of our, our, our talk today, uh, the edited volume of uh, Andrew Peacock and Sara Nuyildos entitled Islamic Literature and Intellectual Life in 14th and 15th Century Anatolia. Um, I would like to begin by introducing our speakers. Um, Sara Nuryildiz is a political, cultural, and intellectual historian of medieval Anatolia, specializing on the Seljuk, Mongol, and Bailey periods. She taught at Istanbul Bilgi University and worked as a researcher at the Orient Institute Istanbul. She currently lives in Berlin while working on a research project based at the University of Florence. In this project, she's examining the history of Erzincan and its hinterland during the Mongol period. Dr. Yildiz is in the midst of completing uh, her, her monograph, Mongol Rule in Seljuk Anatolia, the Politics of Conquest and History Writing, 1243 and 1282, uh, forthcoming from Brill. Andrew Peacock is a professor of Middle Eastern Islamic history at the University of St. Andrews. Peacock's latest publications include Islam Literature and Society in Mongol Anatolia, published by Cambridge in 2019, and Turkish History and Culture in India, published from Leiden in 2021. Um, as also um, spoken by Yamur Hanım, he will be a senior fellow at Anamed in 2022. Uh, between 2012 and 2017, uh, Peacock was the principal investigator on the ERC-funded project, The Islamization of Anatolia, circa 1100 and 1500. In addition to a large-scale database, the project outcomes also included three edited volumes, Islam and Christianity in Medieval Anatolia, co-edited with uh, Yildiz and Buno de Nicola, Islamization, Comparative Perspectives from History, and Islamic Literature and Intellectual Life in 14th and 15th Century Anatolia, also co-edited with Yildiz. It is this latter volume published by Argon Karlag in 2016 that is the topic of our panel today. So I want to, um, I want to begin by addressing uh, Dr. Peacock first um, and asking him about, um, to introduce us to the Islamization of Anatolia project that um, formed the background of uh, this volume. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you very thank you very much, Zena. Uh, yes, so the idea behind the project is quite simply that um, the period between circa 1100 and 1500 um, sees this massive change um, in the history of Anatolia. Uh, its conversion from being an overwhelmingly Christian Greek and Armenian speaking land to it being a predominantly uh, Muslim dominated uh, territory um, with Turkish and to some extent Persian and Arabic as its main literary languages. Um, but despite the importance of this transformation, which you know has massive uh, repercussions in world history with the um, advent of the Ottomans and so on, um, 
this period hasn't really attracted that much attention from scholars. And one of the reasons for this lack of attention uh, is perhaps because the materials that um, most political historians, at any rate, initially resort to are largely absent for medieval Anatolian uh, Islamic history. So certainly compared to the rest of the Middle East, we have a very few uh, chronicles um, and those that we are um, only represent certain very limited areas or periods. Um, so from the point of view of um, uh, political history, uh, this is um, th 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 this this is a, a region where the sort of sources that we usually go to are largely absent, and the same can be said for biographical dictionaries and so on. What we do have, though, is a mass of literary production, literary in the broadest sense of the word, meaning not just poetry, but also religious texts, legal texts, um, a whole host of uh, books which were composed in Anatolia and which were circulated in Anatolia in Arabic, Persian and Turkish. And much of this material has not really received any attention um, from scholarship uh, because it doesn't fit into uh, easy categories of, uh, sort of source material. So the aim of the project was to choose, uh, was to use the unusual um, situation of Anat medieval Anatolian sources uh, in a positive way and to try and use this immense written heritage to understand the process of Islamization from the inside. What texts were people reading? What were they? What was circulating? What does this tell us about uh, the nature of Islam? About the intellectual influences on medieval Anatolia? From which parts of the um, Muslim world uh, did they come? Um, and you know, we can see a whole wide variety of different influences from as far afield as uh, Kashgar and Andalusia, um, as well as the rich Anatolian um, literary production, which as I say, has also received very little attention. So that was the aim of the project overall, and that was done partly by creating a database of the manuscripts of texts that were produced in Anatolia, which is now freely accessible. Uh, and it includes as much information as we can about the places these texts were copied, about um, the people who copied them, and about the patrons who commissioned them, so that we can see the process of circulation uh, of these texts. And hopefully this will be a, re, uh, a resource for future researchers. But we also wanted to go into more detail on certain uh, specific texts and specific issues. And we identified within this period, the 14th to 15th century, um, as one of particular, uh, as one of particular interest, because this sees the emergence of Turkish literary texts for the first time uh, in Anatolia, uh, as well as uh, a great increase in the amount of uh, Persian literary production. Uh, as, as well. So we had a dedicated uh, conference bringing together specialists in different types of literature, uh, different te texts in Arabic, Persian and Turkish, um, to look at some of them in more detail. And that is what, uh, that is what gave birth to this particular uh, volume. Thank you. And um, Sarah, can you explain to us a, a little bit uh, from taking on from Andrew, uh, the premise behind the volume and how it uh, how it uh, relates to the overall look of the project, outlook of the project? Well, um, I think Andrew um, explained very well, actually, um, the premise of the project in the volume actually directly um, reflects that. Um, but basically, it, we could just say like 
we were trying to grapple with the question of how can we as cultural, religious, or political historians deal with a period when you do not actually have historical, like traditionally historical sources like, like chronicles. And so, so from one end, we as historians, we need to learn how to grapple with uh, textual sources that are not actually, you know, historical. And the other hand, uh, we need to also then be able to, to deal with textual issues that literary, literary historians have traditionally dealt with, but have not engaged in any kind of historical context. So we're trying to bring together in a sense, two fields and when you when you think about it um to historicize uh, literary approaches towards these texts and i think what what was um particularly interesting was what kinds of texts were turkish and um the kind of genres and i think and our volume deals with with all of these questions everything from philosophical treatises to the question of the rise of Turkish as a vernacular written, I mean, language. And um, yeah, so uh, sh yeah, I think uh, Andrew covered though pretty well the whole premise of the project, which the volume directly uh, reflects. Um, yeah, as, a, as someone who teaches in a Turkish literature department, of course, uh, both of what you just said means a lot to me because we're uh, sort of what you did and uh, what the volume did is to uh, think beyond dis modern disciplinary boundaries that are sort of less and less meaningful as we go back in, in history in, in, in the context of Anatolia. Um, as you both know, I've been uh, I've been teaching my first master's course and uh, called the vernacular vernacularization in classical Turkish literature, which looks at the vernacularization of uh, Western Turkish. And um, you, uh, the introduction to the uh, the volume was the first reading of the semester, and uh, there will there are more readings to come. Um, but it was interesting to see that. You know, for, for my students who, you know, for the Bailey, we'll, we'll talk about all of this, but for uh, the period in question, um, there's a lot, there's a lot of baggage that they come with, even from middle school to high school education onwards. And it includes just, a, it includes a, a nationalist perspective of uh, on on every front so uh the idea of you know uh the the, uh, the idea of the baby period as uh the birth of an of a national literature as the birth of a national culture um of course and, and the narrative focused on solely on the ottomans and and turkish only in addition to the dating issues of literary historiography that you know that they've uh, that they encounter when they're reading canonical text uh, in of Turkish literary historiography. And so what they've encountered is basically a revision on all of these fronts. Um, and I want to ask you a bit more about all of that. So um, to direct to Sarah, of course, Andrew already mentioned a little bit uh, the problems in the scholarship and, and the lack of attention to the period, but uh, could you elaborate on that a, a little more? Well, yeah, sure. Um, well, let me just focus on one particular issue that has always terribly annoyed me. <laughs> and that is like calling this period pre-Ottoman. Um, you know, you see this in Cloud Kahan, pre-Ottoman Turkey for the Seljuk period. I mean, this is also, I mean, it's a particularly, I think, problem in, in English and other lang uh, Western languages. Um, but, um, you know, the sense that this was kind of a period which that just exists to usher in teleologically the Ottomans who then end up conquering all the other Beyliks, you know, in the post Seljuk period. And of course the Mongols hardly ever really exist in this sort of like narrative. They just come and conquer and, and sort of cause trouble and, you know, the Turkmen rebel and, you know, and they kind of disappear out of the picture. So, um, you know, th this kind of construction of the narrative is coming from a very Ottoman centric perspective. And actually, I mean, um, the Ottomans were very much interested in this period in a certain sense and, and continued working with Seljuk sources, et cetera. And I think that um, early 
um, you know, you know, in the modern period, like earlier Republic historians were very influenced by Ottoman perspectives in this period, in, including Fouad Kaprulu, who is sort of like the founding father of the field. So I think we need to just sort of forget that the Ottomans existed. And, um, and, and, and I like to actually refer to the Beylik period as the post-Mongol period on some level. But um, anyway, yeah, so you, you, that's one particular problem. Um, many others, Andrew touched upon others. Maybe Andrew, you can talk about more things on this respect. Thanks, yes, Sarah. Well, I mean, I think that one of the real problems which uh, the volume and the project as a whole tries to overcome uh, is the uh, disciplinary division according to language, right? You mentioned before, uh, you know, the difference between historians and literary historians, but the other problem is that uh, there's very much a tendency for Arabists to look at texts in Arabic, uh, Persianists to look at texts in Persian, and, you know, Turkologists to look at texts in uh, Turkish, and none of them to look at what's going on in the other literary traditions. But medieval Anatolia is, um, you know, somewhere where you don't just have all three languages being used, but you have um, the same author using multiple languages. So, you know, to give one well-known example, of course, most people think of God of Burhanuddin of Sivas as a Turkish poet, one of the great early Turkish poets. Um, but uh, we have two substantial Arabic prose works written by him. And really, to understand him as a figure, you need to have a look at what he's writing in Arabic, as well as what he's, uh, as well as what he's writing in Turkish. And, you know, of course, we could multiply these examples uh, uh, as well. This is, just, uh, this is just one. So I think, you know, to advance the field, what we need to do is to bring these different languages into conversation with each other. Uh, as well as the uh, different disciplines of uh, philology, literary history, and, um, uh, and, and history. And of course, the, the volume in that respect um, brings together scholars in many different fields. I want to share uh, the, um, the table of contents uh, with uh, our uh, listeners. And, um, Yes, I will show, uh, I will scroll down in a little bit. Um, but in, in that regard, I want to ask, uh, um, Andrew, I want to ask you, um, how do the volumes, the contributions collectively uh, supported, support the argument that raised in the introduction that literary Anatolian Turkish emerged within a multilingual literary landscape? Basically what you also just, just mentioned. Um, um, Could you elaborate? Uh, um, so, I mean, clearly, one of the elements of this is that a lot of uh, early Anatolian uh, Turkish literature uh, is based around either tran translations or adaptations of uh, Persian and uh, Arabic uh, classics. And uh, obviously, I think that uh, Sarah will probably want to talk more about that because her own contribution to the uh, volume was about perhaps one of the earliest of these. Um, uh, um, um, uh, in the Idunad court literature where there was a whole policy of um, supporting translations. But, you know, if we look through the table of contents as well, so Gul uh, Shehri is another example. Again, you know, we usually think of him as uh, an important early Turkish poet with his uh, Garib Name and so on. But in fact, the focus in this volume is on his much less well known but extremely interesting uh, Persian work, uh, the Falak Name. Um, and Gul Shehri is an interesting figure as well, uh, just to focus on him for a moment, because he shows both the local but also the international dimensions of medieval Anatolia, because he's clearly someone who's very much rooted in the milieu of Kurshahir, um, which is this town which uh, has just started to come to prominence in the second half of the 13th century uh, under Mongol rule, probably mainly because it's close to the pastures where the uh, Mongol armies are stationed, you know, so there's a substantial Mongol military presence in the region. Um, and 
at the same time, uh, it plays this important role uh, in the birth of literary Turkish, perhaps partly because some of the texts are aimed to address uh, the, um, you know, some of the elite of the uh, Mongol uh, encampments, which are near, we must remember that spoke Turkish was the, probably the main spoken language of the Mongol army. But also the international dimension is that Gülşehri addresses some of his works to uh, the Ilhan Razan. Um, so this shows how, you know, this is a local literary culture, which is perhaps arises out of a very specific time and place and addresses a very specific local audience in the Kurshahe region on the one hand, but on the other hand, is also looking out internationally to Anatolia's links to the broader uh, Mongol Empire, to the broader Ilkhan Empire. And actually, I motioned to just so can I connect? I'm so glad you brought up Agyu Shehri, one of my favorite poets. Um, yeah, uh, you know, his uh, Mantika Tayyar, yeah, is a very interesting work because, yes, it does draw from its inspiration from Atar's Persian classic, but it is a really, really different piece of work. He really reshapes it to his environment and reshapes it to his, you know, um, his own agenda. And you know, he's in this very complex environment, which which Andrew very nicely summarized, you know, in Kirshehir region, which is a, an important Kushlak for the Mongols. And um, and also he was he was involved, it seemed to in, in some kind of Sufi Ahi, you know, context. And so each text has a different, in a sense, the language reflects the different audiences. And we see this as a running theme with with our works. Yes, sir. actually, uh, Sarah has a, a, an article on uh, this very topic on Gülşehir's Mantık in the first uh, uh, in the first um, uh, book of uh, the project that I mentioned, Islam and Christianity in Medieval Anatolia, and that also uh, hopefully I will be teaching this semester. Um, again, link another output of, of the project, of course, and um, Sarah. So. Um, from leading on from Gushehiri and Kushehir, um, where and when do we see an Anatolian Turkish first emerge as a literary language um, in addition to Kushehir? Well, we, well, I mean, Gushehiri is in Kushehir. We also we we know Ahmed, um, you know, um, you know. Uh, <laughs> I want to say Ahmed Pasha, but I don't want to say that. You know, the Garib Name, um, you know, our author, Ashik. Ashik Pasha. No. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> no, um, so anyway, yeah. So Kushi here was a very, I mean, the earliest text, I believe, is 13, 17? Is, I, I, it's, I, I, it's, yeah, I think it's. It's 1317 is one of our er, our earliest like full Turkish work um, coming from this this milieu and you know 1325 for Garipname or 1324 if I can remember correctly and and then we turn to the uh, Idinid realm which is quite a different context a completely different context it's very far from the Mongols. It's on the coast of the uh, Aegean. And we see like in the early 1330s, particularly medical works. Um, and actually this, this project uh, is, is when I became first interested in medicine, one of my sort of side fields, because I had to read these identity medical texts in, in, old Ottoman, in old Anatolian Turkish. And anyway, I became fascinated with them. And so, so we see that, you know, um, in one context, a kind of non-courtly milieu in Kirche here, but perhaps one that is is a community of, of Sufis and Ahis. And then in the other uh, place, we see um, a, a rising court where which is on the, the coast, who which is very connected. The Idinids are extremely well connected with the Islamic world because of its locality on the ocean, but far from the Mongols. And we see um, construction in the Idinid region 
of uh, the earliest Medresa mosque complex, which has Mamluk, perhaps workmanship in it. You know, this, this um, Haji Pasha coming from Cairo in the later period of the 14th century, directly to, to the court of Issa Bey of, I, of the Aydinid period. So, um, you know, so we have, we have other examples of Bailix, John Darted, et cetera. Uh, I mean, it would, it, I think one of the, the things that we would have been really nice if we, if we had more time and people and energy to actually have focused a lot on the text from that John Darted period as well. So um, yeah, not, not from the Ottomans, okay? <laughs> <laughs> And of course, and of course, Sarah's contribution. I mean, uh, it, in addition to the introduction, uh, Sarah's chapter was on the Idenids. And uh, on that note, I want to uh, address Andrew and maybe uh, to speak a little bit about the role of Sivas as a cultural center in relation to your in, uh, chapter on Kadibur Hanettin. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, thank you, Zainab. So, I mean. Uh, my chapter focuses on one of the Arabic works um, written by uh, Qadr Borhanuddin, um, which uh, has the title of uh, the uh, Ixera Sa'ad, or the uh, Elixir of uh, Happiness. Um, so, on the one hand, this is a work of sort of Sufi uh, theology, which is quite conventional, superficially, it looks as if it is uh, uh, in the tradition of Sufi writings uh, inspired by Sadruddin al-Qunawi, uh, Ibn al-Arabi, his, uh, his famous disciple, um, who wrote a vast number of uh, works and was widely, widely imitated. Um, but on the other hand, uh, there are allusions within this work which suggests connections to Hurufism, for example, uh, this uh, new intellectual movement which um, arose in Iran um, and which uh, saw the letters of the Arabic script as encoding um, cosmic secrets, um, which Hurufis believed they could uh, unfold. Um, so, the text has allusions towards uh, uh, allusions towards that and towards the possible involvement of um, uh, of Qadi Burhanuddin in at least comparable um, interests, even if he wasn't a Hurufi himself. Um, and of course, this is also uh, the period where um, when the early Turkish poet Nisimi, oh. who is a Hurufi is active and some of uh, Qadi Burhan Adin's Turkish poems actually uh, re represent conversations with um, Nesimi through the, through the genre of, uh, uh, of Nazires where they reply to lines in each, in, in each other's works. So, you know, um, these elements suggest that Sivas is um, is a complicated place with, you know, we don't have that many works beyond those of Burhan Adin that we can uh, trace to this particular time and place. But even if we read these works closely, then they can open up um, a much more complicated picture of the intellectual environment um, of the period than is initially, uh, initially apparent. I mean, the other interesting thing about Qadr Burhanuddin is that we are quite well able to place his works in their historical context because we're lucky to have um, this very detailed biography of him in Persian um, by uh, Aziz Astarabadi, um, this courtier of his who wrote this elaborate uh, Persian biogra uh, biography of Burhanuddin, uh, the Bazm Razm, uh, which incidentally is one of the very few sort of chronicles that survives from medieval Anatolia, so it has been published, although it's rather, perhaps rather under uh, utilized by, uh, by scholars, possibly because of its um, ornate language, but also because it's in some ways a slightly difficult text to 
used because it is very much focused on the figure of the Qadr Sultan, uh, Burhan uh, himself. So I think there's a lot to, uh, uh, you know, these three examples actually uh, also show the importance of using all three languages because the full picture of what's going on in Sivas only comes out when one exploits the Arabic, Persian and Turkish material and you put it in conversation with each other as well. Actually, uh, can I just add um, a bit to um, Andrew's mentioning the Hurufis and in Avarlin we have a, a contribution by Ibrahim Binbash who wrote about coins, Hurufi coins from a little bit later period. So I just wanted to point out we weren't just only looking at what is like traditional literary text, but actually coins were considered a text in, in this volume and we have that contribution. And he's in particularly looks at uh, Hurufi coins from the Arzanjan region, which is not that far from Sivas. So we have a kind of continuity of these kinds of, um, you know, religious intellectual movements. And um, just wanted to plug um, that in as well. Yeah. Also to add to what An Andrew said, Andrew's, um, contribution to the volume. I mean, also, you know, relates to what we just said about sort of a re revision of uh, Republican literary historiography, because uh, he's a figure uh, who's known for uh, solely almost for his Turkish production. But uh, Andrew shows us that, you know, in the, it, when you look at the number of manuscripts and, and the effect that his work had the Arabic text that he produced uh, may have been much more widely read. Um, anyway, yeah, I mean, perhaps um, for you to say, but <laughs> I mean, I mean, of course, you know, this is this is one of the interesting things is that you know when you start looking at the manuscripts, um, you know, some of these very very famous works uh, don't seem to have been very widely circulated at all. I mean, Qadabur uh Turkish poetry survives in a single manuscript um, held in held in London, um, so. Uh, the fame he has today isn't necessarily something that he had at the time, at least not in that field. And, it, you know, it's interesting that um, his biographer, Astarabadi, doesn't make any allusion to his Turkish compositions at all. Uh, he, talks about, he talks about his writing as in Arabic, so he's perfectly well aware of his literary agenda. And he also talks about him writing things in Persian, which sadly have not come down to us. Um, but uh, uh, there's no mention at all of his... Turkish poems, which is what he's named for today. So, um, I'm going to look back to a larger question, but that Sarah directed to you, but you could also maybe um, um, open up a little bit more in your own contribution uh, to the volume in that regard. Um, how does so what is the, in, in this whole context, how, what is the role of patronage? How does it shape uh, textual production? You, you, you talked about the Sufi milieu versus a, a court milieu and how do, how do, how do those landscapes, uh, what do they mean to us in this context? Yeah, um, that's a very, very uh, good question. Um, the question of patronage and um, well, uh, if you look at the Idinids, it's, it's a, a very interesting patronage pattern. Um, you know, the, the first, um, you know, Idinid ruler was not quite literate. And we know from Ibn Batutu, he has wonderful, um, you know, sort of a vignettes of life at the court of the Idinids and how he would, um, have majlis, you know, these, um, you know, gatherings of scholars and others from his court. And, and, and he would have a visiting Arab scholar uh, come and, or, or the residential Arab scholar, explain to him, you know, a religious text in Arabic, and, and then translate it on the spot into Turkish, or have it translate on the spot into Turkish. So we have this um, you know, this, this, this attempt, you know, for someone who had been just previously a, a commander, a warlord to become literate in, in, in religious um, texts. And then we see later in the, this, he's ruling in the 1330s, we see later in the 1370s, his grandson Isabe is, is himself extremely well educated and an amazing patron of Persian, Turkish and Arabic and of medical texts as well, like, like 
his the previous Idinid rulers. And so you know you see you see how um, the acculturation occurs, you know, from the Idinids in a very nice because we have so many texts and so many examples, which I cover in my um, in my contribution to the volume. And one other thing too is like is the emphasis of adab, like what I call it, like adab is a kind of like it's a discourse. It's it's not just a genre. It's a it's a way of making accessible through literary works the kind the, the the you know not only what is required to be to to that one should know as an educated person, but but also it, it you know the kind of political culture that is being fostered in these in these courts are reflected in these works, you know, a kind of a courtliness. And even medical works can be a kind of adab and anything can be adab if it has a kind of pedagogic, a kind of padaya, you know, as they say in the Greek context, you know, sort of a, a kind of didactic um, um, aim for creating, a, you know, general knowledge in, in many different fields. And this, this is, is one, you know, one aspect of, of patronage in these courts, you see. And the other thing too is very interesting. I mean, uh, most early Turkish texts were either religious primers or medical primers. Like this is where you see the most work. And this, this reflects a, a kind of need and not necessarily, sometimes you, for instance, Haji Pasha wrote his work without a patron. And so you see works, a lot of vernacular works without patrons. So patronage, it, it's a very complicated and complex question and it's hard to, to over, you, one should not overgeneralize on, on you know, it being the whole reason for production. Uh, so the Sufi milieu in that regard can be considered considered as an alternative form of patronage, maybe even. Well, yeah, I mean, you have to define what you mean by patronage. I mean, for instance, Haji Pasha writes specifically, I am writing this uh, for anyone who, you know, finds himself without a doctor and needs, you know, medical knowledge. And this is not because someone's asked him, because someone is paying him to do it, but basically because, you know, he sees that this is something he feels compelled to do for various reasons. So, um, but of course, you know, in Sufi context, you know, patronage can be quite complex. Um, and do, Which do you, you know to... most about, like. <laughs> <laughs> um, Andrew, did you want to, uh, did you want to add something? Uh, yeah, I mean, just to say, well, I mean, just to agree, I mean, you know, because we don't really have much evidence from uh, outside of the literary texts themselves, we're largely reliant on the information about patronage from what their prefaces say, but it's quite hard to tell what their prefaces are actually telling us. Are they telling us that um, the ruler has commissioned this work to be done because he has a specific interest in it, for example, or are they telling us that this is a jobbing writer who's going around trying to look for someone who's going to give him a reward for uh, his work. So, you know, I mean, sometimes we find um, manuscripts with different prefaces uh, because clearly the author has been trying to sell it to uh, different patrons. Um, so this is also why attention to the manuscripts is very important. One can't just rely on a single version of a text because the manuscripts serve to sort of Complicate, uh, complicate the story in this way. And I think we have a mixture of both, right? I mean, clearly with the idonance where we have a very large number of texts produced, there must surely be some kind of um, patronage from the rulers for this. Um, but in other circumstances where we just have a single text, for example, I mean, for example, there's um, uh, an Arabic, philosophical text which is produced for the uh, ruler of Beishehir around the turn of the 14th century. It's the only text we know of from Beishehir. Is this because the emir, emir had the Bey had a real interest in this text or was it just that uh, 
this author turned up with a pre-prepared text that he thought he'd try and um, dedicate to this particular uh, particular ruler, and that's the copy that happens to uh, come down to us. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so much, this is, in that regard, maybe, I mean, I, I will come back to the question of manuscripts, because this is a whole <laughs> new, uh, you know, area that we must really talk about, like, what are, you know, what, what are the implications of manuscripts as a source? But I will, I will, I will before that, I will ask another question. Um, I'm directing this to Andrew. Um, so another as important aspect of, of manuscript culture uh, that we see, um, what was the role of traveling scholars and immigrants, uh, immigrant scholars in shaping the intellectual and religious landscape of, of Islam, Islamizing Anatolia? Um, thank you. Well, I mean, that's a, a very good question. I mean, obviously, we know most about this from with regard to the 13th century, where we have lots of famous examples of Im immigrant scholars. I mean, most famously of all, of course, um, Rumi, but also Ibn Arabi um, and numerous other big names who make their way to Anatolia for one reason or another, often connected with the Mongol invasions, although certainly not certainly not exclusively. I think from the 14th century onwards, especially from the second half of it, then the picture becomes more complicated and there seems to be, uh, obviously, uh, there is a larger indigenous Anatolian intellectual elite. So there are still a lot of people who go abroad to receive an education, particularly in uh, you know, certain specific fields. And we know that in Cairo, uh, there's a specific concentration of Rumis who are, who are studying there, some of whom stay there and some of whom come back, like Hajar Pasha, um, whom, Sarah, uh, whom Sarah mentioned. Um, but I think we have um, a larger group, perhaps, of authors who um, can't immediately be traced to uh, immigrant families from the later 14th, 14th century uh, onwards. Um, and this, you know, probably itself reflects the growing process of Islamization, at least in a cultural sense, in that there is this development of uh, an intellectual elite by this period, which can sustain literary production. But of course, immigrants remain important throughout the whole of the medieval period and beyond. Um, you know, Mehmet the Conqueror, of course, is attracting large numbers of immigrants uh, uh, from both the Arab world and from the larger Iranian world as well, from Central Asia, um, to uh, his court. Uh, and this is something that continues, uh, continues into the 16th century uh, and beyond. Uh, you know, it's always very attractive for rulers to um, first of all, show that they can attract the uh, uh, attract famous names to their courts, and also to hope to use these famous names to promote their own fame internationally. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to um, go back a little bit to the beginning of uh, of our discussion and. Um, you know about like how the contribution of the volume to our understanding of of republican uh, to literary historiography and historiography and how that ties in with with uh, the manuscript evidence that came out of the project and that uh, we can see within the context of of this uh, volume um sarah can you speak a little bit uh, about um what came out of the volume and, and uh, of the project in terms of dating uh, of of uh, vernacularization in Anatolia. Yeah, well, I mean, it is kind of a vexed issue as to when is Anatolian Turkish first, what, what is considered a literary language when it's systematically used to, to write in. Now, I know that um, Mustafa Koç um, has published a piece on uh, maybe some, uh, you know, some, a very small, um, text which is written in Turkish from 1286, I think from Develuka area, 
Um, and he claims that to be the earliest example of Turkish based on solid manuscript evidence. And I mean, he may have a point, but we really don't see systematic production in Anatolian Turkish. There has been a tendency in older scholarship of the, of the first half of the 20th century onward, I mean, particularly to emphasize that in the Seljuk period, Anatolian Turkish began to be written as a literary language, but really there is no true like literary uh, manuscript evidence. The idea that this Ahmed Fakı, Fakı who composed a Shafname, I mean, we have one text and it's surely not from the, I mean, the language is, 14th century, perhaps. I mean, but there's nothing in the existing manuscript of this work that can say this was written in the Seljuk period. Um, there's no dates. There's no no internal indications. It's just guessed. It's just assumed. Um, and and unfortunately, there was not as much of rigorous sort of manuscript based scholarship on these questions by earlier Turkish literary historians. Um, so I, I said, aside from Mustafa Koch's article, I have never not seen anything convincing from a manuscript, from manuscript evidence showing us that Turkish was written before the 14th century in any systemic way. So really, we could we have to just admit that is it is a 14th century phenomenon and. And we have to view it in the context of the political and cultural landscape of basically late and post Mongol Anatolia. And in fact, in places where Mongol rule remained most, um, um, you know, uh, intact, for instance, with Sivas, Arzanjan, et cetera, we do not see Turkish emerging as vernacular. It seems to emerge in more peripheral areas. I mean, well, Kirsha here is under Mongol rule, but nevertheless, how how really, I mean, you know, Gazan Han is pretty far from Kirsha here at this point, even though uh, Gushehri is is considering him a patron or attempts to make him a patron. But, um, you know, and, and I think that the, 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 it, the on the, the Uch Bay, you know, is, is, is really where we see most early you know, vernacular works becoming systematically produced, like in the Idinids and the Jandarids, et cetera. Um, yeah, so, I mean, that's one issue that I guess we, we are at, in opposition to in, in the sort of standard, you know, Turkish textbook. Andrew, did you, you want to add something to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, just to add that, uh, I mean, I think that uh, Sarah's right, but uh, the other context for the development of Turkish in Anatolia that we have to understand it in is the broader development of Turkish in the Mongol Empire, and specifically uh, the Golden Horde, which I think is extremely influential, you know, because the Horde is the first state where Turkish becomes the language of administration, becomes a language of administration. Turkish is clearly by the second half of the 13th century, what the Horde are using as the main language of their diplomatic correspondence. By the end of the 13th century, there's the emergence of a literary tradition in you know, what's branded as Khwarezmi and Turkish, I mean, you know, the boundaries between some of these dialects are pretty, pretty fluid. Um, but you know, let's just say some sort, the sorts of Eastern Turkish, which were in use under the Horde. And it's clear that much of that passes to Anatolia as well. You know, so there's a circulation of texts in uh, either in Eastern Turkish or including Eastern Turkish uh, linguistic elements. Um, there are Going back to your point about immigrant uh, scholars, one place where from the late 13th and early 14th century onwards, we can definitely see lots of immigrant scholars is uh, from the Golden Horde, particularly ones with the name Khwarezmi and so on. And probably one of the reasons they're in Anatolia is because it's one of the rather few areas of the Muslim world of this period, which is officially Hanafi as well, so it's a good place for them to go and make their careers. Um, so I think this sort of influence of um, 
the horde uh, of, of the Golden Horde and its promotion of Turkish on um, what, what's happening in Anatolia is something important to bear in mind. And that would also fit well with a date towards the end of the 13th to the early 14th century for the emergence of literary Turkish in Anatolia. Um, thank you. So this, of course, all of this links, you know, patronage and circulation and, uh, you know, uh, the notion of manuscript evidence in, as, um, you know, as, as an idea of manuscript evidence in, in the broadest context possible. Um, and in that regard, um, manuscript, what, what the focus, the refocusing on the manuscript evidence, how does it challenge, well, we've already talked about how it challenges the paradigm of the 13th century as uh, the emergence, the dating of the emergence of Turkish to the 13th century. Um, Andrew, um, Continuing along with that, um, as another challenge, what would you say um, about the role, the, the difference between manuscript evidence and biographical dictionaries, and how how um, what 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 can we find out about the existing paradigms and how we can how we can rewrite them in, in a certain context? Um, thank you. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that. Um... You know, um, as I mentioned with uh, Carter Bohana Dean, I mean, clearly there's often a discrepancy between what one finds in the textual sources which talk about a given author, uh, and then what we actually find in the in the manuscript record. So, you know, I mean, it's quite common uh, for biographical dictionaries of, uh, or, or other sources which talk about authors to be quite selective in what they talk about. Sometimes they will omit works either because they're not of interest or because they are not something that the author of that particular text approves of. Um, um, so, you know, that is another reason why it's important to uh, not to rely on, if you like, these secondary sources to focus on the manuscripts themselves. Of course, the manuscripts themselves are not wholly unproblematic either because we have, you know, frequent cases of uh, text being attributed, the same text being attributed to different authors in the manuscript tradition. Uh, we often, we also have cases of um, falsified colophons, um, sometimes to increase the manuscript's value. So the manuscript will purport to be uh, of a much earlier date than it clearly is, uh, or will purport to be by um, a famous scribe or by a famous author. And of course, this is also a way of um, perhaps sometimes people trying to get legitimacy for views which otherwise would be unacceptable by, foister, by trying to sort of foist them on uh, a better known uh, existing author rather than publishing things under, the, under their own name. So there are all kinds of problems with uh, attribution and with dating, uh, which need to be confronted seriously when we look at the manuscript sources. And I think, you know, one of the problems is that there are too few people working on the field and there's often a tendency to take the statements in manuscripts themselves at face value, whereas really they need careful and critical evaluation and the manuscripts themselves need studying on the basis of not just what they claim, but also their codicological features, whether the paleography supports the date, for example, that they claim to be. So a complex field that could do with much further research. Um, <laughs> indeed, and on that note, maybe um, we can open that up a little bit. So um, in terms of manuscript, like uh, working on manuscripts as a, the source, a source, what, what does that entail? And um, what is the situation of expertise on, especially manuscripts in medieval Anatolia? Um, would you like to say something about that, Sarah? Yeah, um, well, you know, um, 
we we've seen in the last few years an incredible um you know, sort of interest in manuscript studies in, in, in Europe, especially Hamburg has a huge project ongoing on manuscripts from all over the world in various different cultural and linguistic fields. Um, and, um, you know, we, we, we see that because of digitization, manuscripts are taking on a new role in scholarship and new things are being done with them. But, um, one of the things that I would like to emphasize is though that um, the field is dominated by in, in Islamic studies by um, Arabocentric perspectives on manuscript production, perhaps Cairo based. And now I'm just talking particularly from experience when I went to um, a codicology workshop for a week and the person who was the expert, the world expert and is one of the biggest world experts there is, um, nevertheless, had a real blind spot when it came to Anatolia and Ottoman things, and he could not conceive of the fact that um, any manuscript on Venetian paper was that was dated before 1500 was not a fake because he said, because, you know, manuscripts in the Islamic world did not use European paper, they used, you know, Eastern or, you know, like paper. Um, uh, not until after 1500, so it must be a fake. And I'm, I'm thinking specifically the Kabusname, which Birnbaum published on, is on paper from Venetian, it's Venetian paper, but it's also from the Western coast of Anatolia where Venetians were trading. And, you know, this idea that, you know, must be a fake this can't be an original text. I mean, the date can't be right because it's the wrong kind of paper. This, this kind of blindness to the actual material realities of Anatolia, I think is, is a huge problem. And I don't think we have, um, you know, we, we need to develop a kind of more regionally focused understanding of manuscripts in Anatolia from the um, Seljuk Beylik period to the Ottoman period and understand better how these things works. We need we need a, um, a you know a book at, like Adam Gottschek wrote one for Arabic manuscripts. We need one for our own particular field, and we need Turkish students in Turkey working in Turkish libraries to really you know be educated. Now I I I have great respect for so many of my colleagues. You know in Turkey you know th they work with manuscripts. They spend their lives in Sulaimania. They know manuscripts, but. We need to actually have publications that guide students and systematize this better uh, so that it's it's not just sort of like um, you have to be at the Sulaimania, you know, under the direction of, of, you know, somebody who happens to be, you know, an amazing reader of these manuscripts, but actually make it accessible to all students. So we need to actually have materials you know, guidebooks. I, I, I really think that Turkey could be, you know, so much that could be developed in this respect. We have, we have most amazing collections in the Islamic world that are extremely accessible by digitization. So I just wanted to plug that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, uh, Andrew, do you want to? Would you want to say something about that? As someone who's worked with manuscripts from all over the world. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, uh, mainly just to 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 agree with Sarah. I mean, uh, Turkey is in a, um, a position where you know it has probably the richest resources of Islamic manuscripts of any country, and they're also very accessible. What it lacks is enough trained people to be able to deal with them. You know, so we need, um, uh, you know, we urgently need more students to gain the necessary skills, both the linguistic ones, but also training of how to deal with manuscripts and so on, and to, to work on them because, you know, there's a, a whole vast literary world out there which remains largely undiscovered and uncatalogued. Um, and, and, okay. and can I add something? I, in my own education at University of Chicago, even though we got, I think, excellent training in dealing with text, we weren't actually trained to deal with manuscripts. When you think about it, nothing systematic. I mean, um, I learned so much actually on this project. This project really was how I learned uh, to deal with manuscripts, and and I had a great mentor, Andrew. So I want to say thank you for this. Um, yeah, no, because Andrew has spent like just enormous amount of time with manuscripts, 
um, before he began this project, and 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 I had the opportunity to 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 enter this world um, thanks to this project. So, anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, well, there are a few things I wanted to say, uh, but um, yeah, I think that uh, you know one of the difficulties about working in this uh, in this field is that you know um, you need working on menaces is you much you need so much technical expertise that takes so long to acquire that it's hard to gain that expertise while also gaining knowledge of the field, field itself and what what happened like as a whole like a, a, a global look at the field and uh, what happens in, in with a lot of uh, a lot of um, departments in, in Turkey work it with, or history or, or Turkish literature is that you know in Turkish literature they really do focus on manuscripts but most of the time the global outlook isn't there and sometimes in uh, the Western context the global outlook uh, is really focused on but then uh, the technical expertise there's really no time for um, but I. Mm, before we, yeah, before we, um, and of course, I want to thank Andrew too, because I was also, did not mention that, but I was also a, a research fellow on this project, and I was actually a PhD student, so this was my, uh, this was a big training for me, and, uh, you know, working with postdocs and, and, and doctors, which was a big deal at the time, <laughs> and, um, and it was a lot of training, self-training, uh, that I put on, that, uh, you know, I, of course, um, I had a background, but then um, I think a lot of manuscript work is also just a, a endless self-training. <laughs> and what you what what you get though when you're working on a database, or when you're work, not just working on a single text for years, but when you're actually looking at corpuses and and things like that, um, is you you see so many different manuscripts, and that is very different from focusing on one thing, and, and because then you actually acquire a whole different skill set. Um, um, before we um, before we uh, wrap this up and open up uh, open up to questions, do you do you want to add anything? Well, let's just go right to the questions. Um, okay. So let let me let me open them up. One second. <laughs> Uh, the, okay, um, I'm slowly getting them. So, um, so we have a we have a question from uh, Doru Kahraman, uh, who um, who is a geneticist and a Byzantine history PhD candidate from Izmir, um, who just started working on post 1204 Byzantine text. So uh, the question is, um, I'm going, okay, I'm going to read from here. Um, so he has, uh, he says, I've finished, just finished this course on illuminated manuscripts, deciphering secrets, the illuminated manuscripts of medieval Europe. I would be very glad to see a course, a syllabus, or maybe a reading list ge geared towards our local codicological issues, he says, but I think that's exactly what you were saying, Sarah, but maybe that's expected of you <laughs> from, um, I mean, this would be a great, great, great group of scholars or well, I, I, you would I, be, both of you would be great colleagues to do this, obviously, but. but um, I, I think yeah. there are many Turkish scholars who could actually do such a work, you know, I mean, um, you know, I, 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 I just think that the, 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 the idea that such a work needs to be produced, I mean, you know, needs to maybe be more emphasized. Um, but yeah, we, we and, and you know what I realized that when we worked in this project, there's so much we just don't know, um, you know, about paper, you know, history of paper, you know, um, watermarks, et cetera, um, you know, seals. We, we need to have some kind of like a, a really good re resource. We have a kind of a, a, you know, a manual of seals. It's very helpful. Um, uh, on that, uh, can I interrupt? On that note, I did, I haven't seen Binaikut's new book of seals, but apparently it's like it's much bigger now. Um, and uh, anyway, I was just going to say yes, we should mention yeah, yeah. her name <laughs> because yeah, I was visiting well, that's her. That's exciting that she has a book coming out on this. That's um, it will help. Yeah, and um, 
Um, yeah. So I, 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 what, I mean, what do you think, Andrew? What, what is, what is the best way to deal with this issue? Um, yes. I mean, I think that uh, you're right. We need locally focused studies, but at the same time, we also have to. Um, We also have to have regard to the international context as well, you know, because these managed, these people operated in an international context, you know. Uh, to take another 14th century example, Darir, uh, who's, you know, considered one of the early Turkish writers, but I mean, most of his stuff is actually produced for um, rulers in the, in the Mamluk clans in Syria, in Aleppo, and in Egypt, and so on. Um, um, you know, so he may write in what we think of as Old Anatolian Turkish, but he's writing for international audiences. And similarly, you know, if you look at um, authors such as Gülşehri, they also appear in Mamluk collections of poems and so on. So yes, there should be an Anatolian focus, but there also needs to be an awareness of what's go what they sort of uh, what what's going on in the broader region as a whole in terms of what manuscripts look like and how they're produced so that you can see what things are actually different and distinctive about Anatolia and what things actually are uh, inducted to. Well, I, I completely agree with that. I mean, we have Adam Gotchik's book and we have some things though in that, in the, in the, in the more broader context. I mean, so, I mean, those are there and maybe they need, to, you know, we need more such works as well, but we definitely have a big gap when it comes to Anatolia. Um, the other thing too is, um, uh, um, uh, I just, um, actually, I wanted to just uh, um, mention that in Europe, we have this huge, uh, you know, interest in, in manuscripts. We have very few scholars who work actually on medieval Anatolia in Europe and in this period. So there's that, that gap. I mean, you know, um, it's very Arabocentric in its Islamic studies. Um, I don't think there's really any, any much going on anymore for medieval Anatolia. And that's sort of a, that's kind of a, you know, a gap as well um, in the European context. And, um, you know, so uh, I think that, that there is a kind of, you know, the Islamic field tends to marginalize Anatolian things. And I think, you know, this is a problem. And actually, uh, on that note, you know, I wanted to say something about like in, your, in the introduction to the volume, you, you guys talk about how, you know, the Baelic period, well, we, we did say a few things about that, but uh, basically it's seen as a like pre-Ottoman pre makes it like, it's, it seems, it sounds so uneventful. Something is about to happen in the future and that will be grand. <laughs> but in the meanwhile, we're just waiting for it to happen, you know? And what, what the volume shows and what the introduction highlights is that, you know, well, it's, it's actually the complete opposite because, because of all this movement of people, movement of texts and social upheaval, social and political upheaval actually causes so much greater change than would be would take place in another period, in another context. And I think it, highlighting that, that that just like turns our, our whole whole understanding of historiography upside down, and um, I think. Well, and um, in reference to another question that Doru Karaman has um, raised is about the medical texts. And I will email you, Doru, and we, I can, of course, you can start by looking at the book, which, by the way, I will say this, is available um, as a PDF. And if you're wondering how, email me. Well, I'll email you. And... Um, yeah. Uh, thank yeah. you for that. Yes, the question was, um, how can we access these texts, originals, or in published form? Maybe for those of us who don't know, we can just say a, a couple things about where these manuscripts are. Where did we do this research? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, where are they, they locate, I mean, the Suleimania, primarily. 
Um, there is an untapped library in, in Tire, um, the Neji Pasha library, which I always wanted to go, which apparently has an amazing medical collection. Um, but whenever I tried to go, it was under, um, under reconstruction and now I'm not nearby. So I haven't had a chance, but, um, you are in, I believe he is in Izmir, oh, from Izmir. So if you ever go to Izmir, <laughs> um, go to the Najib Pasha library in, in, in Tire and ask about the manuscripts and, um, see the catalog and see what there is. In fact, I got one manuscript uh, was actually, uh, I requested a manuscript from Tire, the library there, and I got it, which is a very interesting identity text, not a manual, a medical one, but still they have a very interesting collection. But I mean, the Suleimania, Bezit library, I mean, you know, the libraries in Istanbul, I mean, this is mostly, and not to mention Manisa, Manisa has a very good collection of manuscripts and um, um, other provincial libraries as well. So, um, but if you want to actually know what the manuscripts are, what the texts are, like I said, um, I will send you an email. Andrew? Yeah, so, I mean, I just wanted to add that, I mean, of course, while Sarah is right, obviously, by far the largest collections in terms of number of manuscripts are in Turkey itself, but there are also substantial there are also important manuscripts which are held outside of Turkey. Um, uh, in the UK, London, Berlin, and so on. So, I mean, these are all listed on our project database. Um, so whilst there is plenty that you can do within Turkey, if you want to get an impression of the manuscript culture of a, as a whole, then some of these international libraries are worth considering. And the other point in their favor is that the British Library, for example, has digitized a considerable number of its manuscripts, as has the Staatsbibliothek in uh, Berlin. Uh, so, you know, they're accessible just from your uh, computer, at, just from your computer at home. Whereas unfortunately, most of the ones in Turkey was there. Quite accessible, they're not quite that easily, easy to get at. On that note, I just found out that the Malik has uh, put has all of all of the questions, uh, all of what I saying, all of the manuscripts, uh, all of the uh, visuals that are on uh, Yasmalar are now downloadable for free directly from the uh, the the, the, the Malik this own website and my student of mine just told me this so um it, actually there's a big change happening in the field as well because well so much is being digitized and so much and and, and, and manuscript reading manuscripts or accessing manuscripts is becoming free um, and that is also an important trend so 10 years ago it would have cost a lot of money just to look at a manuscript and then you would have, or you would have uh, had, you know, microfilm um, shipped to you, and then it would get stuck at the board at customs and all of these things. And now we're actually in, a, in at a time where the, the field is radically expanding. And um, on that note, I also want to add, you know, there is, um, despite what, what Sarah just said, which which I totally agree with, I see, especially in uh, the 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 younger generation of PhD students at the time or ma uh, current PhD students or master's students, uh, an increased interest in Turkish and, and, uh, and Ottoman studies or increased interest in uh, the addition of Turkish to their, uh, their, their, um, their source languages. And uh, so, so I think that in the future, there will be more and more studies looking at uh, these uh, the Islamic language languages in relation to one another. And one of the reasons why is that people are looking for, you know, uh, fields, underdeveloped fields, you know, and things to where, where there's so much more to say, but at the same time, you really have to dig deep. And that is one of the things that, you know, makes uh, that, that was, that is important in the context of this, uh, this project and volume, because uh, when there's, very, very, very little said about uh, about a, a period. Then um, anything you say really starts mattering, which has, of course, has been the case throughout Republican history. 
Um, so anyway, <laughs> I'm talk, talking so, more than my panelists. We have, <laughs> Sorry, we have one more question. From yes, I wanted to. Yes. Yeah. So okay. um, the question from Sam Stevens is, what is the best way to learn features of manuscripts from this region period and how, how they were produced, even though there are not many published sources? And he's thanking us, thanking you guys for the presentation. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it depends a bit on what uh, manuscripts you're interested in. I mean, there is one book that I can uh, recommend by Kyla Jackson, which deals with um, manuscripts, particularly from the 13th century, from uh, 13th, late 13th century Anatolia. And these are particularly uh, the illustrated, uh, sorry, the illuminated ones. Um, uh, you know, so that's uh, that's a very good introduction to uh, a certain type of luxury manuscript um, and the people who patronized it and the main features of it. But, you know, there's quite a lot which is written about um, nicely produced manuscripts which are valued by uh, art historians. Um, uh, 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 there's an, you know, there's an extensive literature about these. What there's much less about is um, manuscripts which aren't pretty to look at, um, which constitute the overwhelming majority uh, of the ones that uh, uh, that survive. Um, and at the moment, in many ways, the way to learn how to deal with them is just to start reading them um, and. Uh, you know, to start with, you don't have any, any idea what's going on, and then you slowly work it out, and uh, it eventually becomes quite feasible. And Andrew, could you give us the title of Kayla Jackson's book? Because I'm assuming it just came out. Then. Uh, let me just uh, check up so I get it so I get it right. Um, um, put it in the chat as a reference. Yes, and I will put it in the chat chat uh, just one second because I don't want to um, um, I don't want to make a mistake um, it is Islamic manuscripts of late medieval I'll put it in I'll put it in the and when was it published was it I very, very recent it was published, uh, 20, 2020 yeah in the past year okay um, well, there was, <laughs> there was actually, I had one more question that I didn't ask during uh, our panel. I want to, uh, if you guys, you allow, and if we have a little bit of time, I want to ask a little bit about that because we, we talked about manuscripts. We've been talking about manuscripts. I want to divert our attention a little bit to texts. And, um, you know, in that regard, we, um, we were talking to Sarah er earlier about, and we, all three of us, I guess, have this perspective where um, communities make texts and texts make communities. Um, so uh, there is an interrelation uh, in that respect. And um, Sarah, can we discuss um, what we were talking about earlier about Brian Stock's concept of, of textual communities and how it might be useful in discussing the emergence of vernacular texts in Anatolia? Yeah, um, you know, Brian Stock is somebody who, you know, is very well known and a classic, basically, he wrote his book, uh, what was it, um, uh, The Implications of Literacy um, in 1983, so it's, it's, it's not a recent work, but it's been a very influential, his, his concept of textual communities, um, and, you know, he used it in a very specific historical, social specific context when he was writing about dissenting religious groups in 11th century Europe and how the emergence of literacy and vernacular text actually shaped the rise of these dissenting religious groups. Now, I think we could, we could make perhaps parallels in the Anatolian context for, for instance, Sufi circles and authors you know, in their own textual communities, maybe not in the sense, you know, in the same way that Brian Stock, you know, used in his specific context. But 
Um, but I do think that uh, groups of people are reading each other's works or reading the same texts or having the same interpretive um, understanding of the text in a certain time and place. And these create cohesive sociopolitical groups. And, you know, texts have a life of their own in a sense. They have later reception and are read differently among different groups and in different times. You know, they're not just, you know, this kind of, um, you know, it, reader readers are, are half, you know, are, are half the interpretation. I mean, uh, it's not just a, um, a text that remains, you know, the same. So I think it would be really, really useful when we look at, say, Sufi groups, when we look at not just one text, don't read just one text, but we need to read texts in groups, you know, in as part of a sort of textual community. I think we can understand much better what is being debated amongst them, what is, um, you know, rather than just from one text, which is sort of, there tends to be, perhaps because of true material reasons and reasons of time and energy, people focus on one text when they do, a, you know, when they study, you know, their masters their, or whatever, but um, we really need to, to look at texts in groups and as communities. And I think, for instance, Bektashi literature, like when you read Elvan Chelebi, you know, his Mena Kabul Kutsia, you, I don't think you can read it without, un, and understand it truly without reading other similar 14th century and 15th century texts of the same genre. So, um, so that's how I think that the idea of textual communities is, is, is very useful for the way we can approach our work. And Andrew, do you want to add something to that? Um, uh, I think that, uh, I think that, uh, no, I agree. I don't really think that I, uh, I don't really think that I've got anything anything to add. I think that Sarah's, uh, um, you know, covered that quite well. But I think that, yeah, the point that it's important to look at groups of texts and not just in, not just individual texts is a very important one because I think that, you know, one of the problems in the limited amount of scholarship that there there, there is is that there's often a tendency just to extract. A single text and focus rigorously on that. Um, but if you don't understand the sort of context that it comes from and the other text that it's um, responding to and addressing, um, then you also don't really understand the text. So I think that the, it, it, it's essential really for our understanding of, uh, you know. Um, yeah, and if just to add to that, like if you, um, you know, the, if we think about like the interrelationship of, let's say, my contribution and Bruno's contribution to the, the volume, I wanted to also mention Bruno de Nicola because he was also a research fellow on, on the project. But I mean, his, 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 um, his contribution was on a text that was against antinomianism. So, or, you know, creating a certain type of community that was, that was uh, through, um, this, uh, through um, discluding those who do not adhere to the Sharia, and then like, and then there is my contribution, who is also creating that is also creating a type of community that you know uh, is um, sort of the complete opposite. Looking at looking at religious scholars as the other, as those who do not understand the real meaning of Islam, and that creates a textual community. So while you know it's 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 like it's really important to see how text interrelate in groups and also in opposition in opposition to one another. So, and I think that, you know, um, the, the concept of intertextuality in modern studies is sort of, you know, we have that so much of that here. And, and from, you know, from all of the, what, that, all of the things that you've said throughout uh, the panel, um, but we don't really think about that in, in those terms, in the terms of, of the idea of intertextuality. Um, Okay, well, I think we're, we're going to wrap this up. I want to thank both of, both of you and, uh, and uh, Coach uh, University, uh, Anamed, um, uh, research for this, uh, this research center on Anatolian civilizations for this panel. And I want to, yeah, I'm directing the floor to Yamur.
Uh, we also would like to uh, thank you so much for this great talk, Dr. Yildiz, Dr. Ustu, and Dr. Peacock. I would also like to thank our attendees for joining us. Um, please follow us through our social media accounts and also our website for the um, our upcoming events. See you soon. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.